Hi, well, welcome to EdChat Interactive. And again, uh, for those of you who were on a little bit earlier, my name is Mitch Weisberg, and I'm hosting you tonight with uh, Steve Piha, who's going to be talking about uh, the teaching of writing. And uh, let me just, uh, I guess, right before we started, we are having two sessions next week. On February 15th, we're continuing the Corwin series. We're having Jim Knight, who's going to be having a conversation about how to have better conversations. And then on February 18th, we're going to be bringing Giancarlo Brodo, who has written extensively on what works in one-to-one -one computing. Um, certainly, the, you've all heard stories about how schools have, uh, have implemented one-to-one -one either through tablets or laptops or, or whatever, and how it hasn't necessarily in, engendered learning. Um, he's compiled stories of how teachers and principals have implemented one-to-one -one where it's really worked. So you, you, you registered here. I'm sure you know how to register. It's at www.edchatinteractive.org. And now, without further ado, uh, let me bring up Steve. Having me tonight. Uh, it's really here, and I do want to thank Mitch uh, again for having me in. Uh, the second of four sessions that we're doing together on the, the second Wednesday of, of the month. So it'll be another one uh, in March, another one in April. Right. Um, tonight, we are focusing on details. Um, this, to me, is the single most important thing that I need to get from kids in order to get their writing even to the point where I can work with it. Um, I found over the years that the more effort I put into teaching kids about detail, um, all the different strategies, all the different kinds of details we can use in all the different types of writing, uh, the more work I put in on this, uh, the better the kids get. And that's a funny thing for me because when I started working in classrooms about 20 years ago, I was sort of under the impression that there were like grade level expectancies. Um, and I found that uh, this was not true with writing. Um, it's probably not true with anything, but especially not true with writing. Uh, the first year that I was working with kids, paragraphing was a, a late third grade, early fourth grade expectancy. Um, five years later, once I learned how to teach paragraphing, I could get it from kindergartners by the end of the year. And it wasn't like the kids out of it wasn't like everybody got smarter. I just sort of learned a few things about how to teach. And the same is true with details. I used to have to just beg at kids to write more than a sentence or two. Um, and so over the years, I've just added to my repertoire more and more strategies, more and more ideas for helping kids add detail to their writing. And um, now uh, I regularly get far too much uh, writing to work with. But at least we have something to, uh, to, to work toward. Uh, the, the, the main, uh, the subtitle of this is getting the writing that we want. And um, I thought I'd start it out. I have a lot of slides here. I'm going to go through some of them and, and then just skip ahead at various times, especially if I hear from you uh, in the uh, IM window. Um, I, but I wanted to let you know that uh, this time I've put two slideshows together that are complete slideshows. Uh, and I have the deck that I can give to you. Uh, in fact, I'll mail each of you a little notice with a download so that no matter what happens tonight, no matter what we cover, what we don't cover, you'll get the whole deck, uh, probably a link to it tomorrow. Um, and there's a lot of more, a lot of other free stuff uh, you can pick up at my website anytime. So uh, let's get started. Um, clean up my window here. All right. So uh, Mitch, would you uh, start us off with our, our first slide after... After my introduction slide there. So Steve, did, did you not, because I had the slides up a second ago. Did you not see yes, you did. I saw, I saw that. All right. All right. I'll, I'm going to pull myself down. I just want to make sure. Uh, yeah, I, yeah, the whole screen. It was great. So I'm, I'm ready to, ready to move forward. OK, here we go. I'll move my video window out of the way. Okay, so um, 
oftentimes, I when I work with kids and when I work with teachers, I just start out with uh, some examples of, of where I hope we're headed. And so I pulled a few. Uh, we won't look at them all, but I wanted to show you a few. And remember, the focus here is on details. These are all kids that I worked with in conjunction with their classroom teachers. And um, I just wanted to, to read you a couple things and let you see a couple pieces really quickly uh, so we can kind of set the ball for what we're what we're shooting to accomplish. This one's called the Daffodil Parade. Boom, the trunk slammed, bang, the car door slammed as we got out of the van. Buses lined up on the sidewalk. The screeches of the buses were annoying. Screech, screech. We walked and walked until we found a place to sit for the parade. I saw a grease van and someone threw me a daffodil. The petals were soft, it smelled pretty. A Titanic float sailed by. The schools had cheers. One school's band was Star Wars. Oh, a dummy was shot out of a cannon. Meyer there. It made me jump. We ate snacks at the parade, sandwiches and juice and carrots. They were good. We sat on a blanket. Things blew everywhere. The floats went by. Whoo clunk. Finally, the parade was done. We put the blanket in the trunk. Boom. It slammed again. We drove away as I thought how much fun I had. That's a really nice short piece. I like kids to write short because they tend to write better. Um, and there's some really nice descriptive details there. Mitch, would you shoot the next screen for me? This, this was done by a first grader. So this is sort of the level of detail I expect to get from a first grader by the end of the year. And we'll, we'll talk about how, uh, how we're able to do that. So let's go to the next one, Mitch. Uh, this is an excerpt from a much longer piece called The Attack of the Older Brother. This was actually from a prompted uh, district benchmark assessment. So this is a very formal uh, kind of thing, a timed writing. Um, I think the prompt was something about, tell me about a time when you were scared or something like that. My older brother has tried to scare me many times. One of the worst times is when I got home from school and expected to find him waiting for me or watching television. But he wasn't home, so I yelled for my dad outside. My dad wasn't home either. This was weird. There was always someone home after school, but that day I was alone. I walked all over the house, opening doors, looking in rooms, calling for other members of my family. Nothing. Then, right when I was walking into my brother's room, boom, he jumped out of the closet. I screamed and ran out into the hall. I'll never forget the attack of my older brother. I think it will scar me for life. Uh, Mitch, show the next screen. That's a third grader. Um, you can see that, that there's a lot of good detail, just like the first grader. There's just a little more sophisticated vocabulary, a little more sophisticated, uh, more correct sentence structures. And of course, this piece is about 400 words long. Uh, this is just one of the more descriptive uh, sections. So let's go to the next one. This is another uh, short excerpt. Uh, this is from the end of a piece called Our Family Cabin at the Beach. This is a young man, and I think he's writing about uh, the summer trip they always take to a cabin where their family goes. No matter what time of day it is, there's always something to do. We play volleyball and badminton. We lay out in the sun and read. We snuggle up in warm blankets and toast marshmallows over a campfire while dad and grandpa take turns telling the same ghost stories we've heard so many times before that they've gone from being scary to being funny to being just another family ritual none of us wants to let go of. Each year as we get ready to make the day-long drive to the ocean, I wonder if the magic will have worn off, if I will have finally outgrown our annual gathering. But this never happens. The magic is in the people, not the place. It's the only time of year we're all together. So next one, that's a fifth grader. And you can see that, that, that again, we're getting the same good levels of detail. The big difference as kids get older is getting great sentence constructions now. Uh, we talked about how to get those sentence constructions last week. Uh, and, and that's basically the type of, the, the biggest type of change that I see as kids get older, as long as I'm giving them all the same tools for details. Um, why don't we go to the next one, Mitch? Um, this is cute. This is a re this is the opening of a research paper uh, on on George Washington. It's that standard um, we all had in school, um, uh, famous people reports, like for American history or something. Um, so this is called "There's No Place Like Home." On a dark December night in 1776, as he led a barefoot brigade of ragged revolutionaries across the icy Delaware River, George Washington said, "Shift your fat behind, Henry, but slowly or you'll swamp the darn boat." He was talking to General Henry Knox, they called him Ox for short. There's a painting of George Washington where he's standing up in a boat scanning the riverbank for redcoats. 
I always thought he just wanted a good view, but I guess the reason he was standing was because he didn't have a place to sit down. So again, this goes on. That's a sixth grader, and you can you can kind of see that there's a little more sense of storytelling. Uh, it's obviously a more advanced reader, um, but also that little bit of I don't know what you call it. There's a little bit of sense of humor there, almost a little silliness. When kids pop into middle school, at least here in the U.S., they start to make little jokes uh, sometimes to start their more serious pieces. Uh, Mitch, let's go ahead about... Okay, here's a good one. We'll end with this. This is a seventh grader. Um, this is a work of... This is from a piece of fiction. It's called Outlander. I remember the night of the fires. The Outlanders were burning all the houses to the ground. Our units struggled to defend us, but a dozen units from a dozen townships couldn't stop them. They just kept coming. I watched from my hiding place, the place my parents had told me to go if something like this ever happened, but they never prepared me for what I would see. Despite the noise of sword upon sword, the screams of men, women, and children running for their lives, and the angry crackle of the fires that slithered and hissed through our village like a thousand deadly snakes, I fell asleep. So what you see there, this is seventh grade, at this point, the grade level doesn't really matter very much. Almost all kids are going to write to the same level. As long as I teach them the same things, what you see here and what you see in all of them uh, is sort of a commonality of a certain type of detail. So Mitch, go ahead, uh, screen, and let's get past this one. That's just an eighth grade piece. All right, so throw, throw a few notes in the um, IM window. What do you think is the single defining element? There is a single defining element, an aspect of detail that ties all these pieces together. Every one of these kids from first grade to eighth or ninth grade has received all the same lessons using all the same strategies that I'll show you as we do our second session tonight. So what do you see uh, in these pieces that you would think of as the single defining element that ties them all together? Throw some notes into the, uh, into the window. Uh, okay, Amy says they're staying on topic, good details, and sense of ending. That's all true, and those are all things I, I teach pretty regularly. Um, the other, uh, let's, let's focus in on the details specifically. Good sentence structure, absolutely. Um, see, tell me to think about the details themselves. That, that's really what I'm going for here, since this is a workshop on details. Yep, they're using senses. The details are sensory. OK, so now we're getting closer to it. I call all of this showing. Um, whether the details, uh, when we think about sensory details, almost every sensory detail we get in most writing is either sight or hearing. And it's almost all what you see. Um, and so I try to break that up a lot, and I talk about showing versus telling. This is something we've all heard about. I think probably our teachers talk to us about it. They say, show, don't tell. But when I was in school, I never got any specific instruction about how to do that. Um, so when I started teaching, of course, I had a terrible time teaching it and um, spent several years developing some things that would help kids show. And that's the big emphasis here. Uh, and it's what all the tools and strategies will do for us today. So Mitch, uh, why don't you fire up the next slide for me? And I'll try to find out what happened to my window. <laughs> OK, there it is. But I can't see it because I took it out of full screen. Whoa. Wrong thing. Sorry, guys. Oh, there it is. Thanks. Um, how is it possible for kids at different grade levels to attain similar results? Very simply, they all get the same instruction. One of the things that I'm really, really dedicated to is providing you and kids with tools at work uh, that are that are pre-differentiated. That is to say, we all have kids no matter what grade level we're working at. We have a range of abilities and interest levels in the classroom. And we have to have tools that can be easily differentiated because we have differentiated learners. And I don't want to write five different lesson plans, and neither do you. So every tool that we have here uh, can be used at all levels um, with simple modifications. 
Um, let's go to the next slide if we could. And that's how we get the same results. Every kid gets the same thing. So we're going to we're going to put everything into two categories tonight. The first section is going to be on what are the instructional conditions that um, are present uh, when we get this kind of writing to get the most to get the writing that we want. And then I'll in the second set half we'll do the detail strategies. Um, I'll probably go through the instructional conditions a little more quickly so that we have more time to go to the strategies. I like this notion of conditions for learning. I think it's Brian Camborn's. Uh, idea, and I read his work a long time ago, so this is not based on his work. But but I think when I teach and I talk to other people about teaching, I say, you know, there are certain conditions that have to exist in the room uh, in order to get a certain result. And I know that I don't get the result unless I have these things going. So these are the s a small set of the instructional conditions in writing that are necessary for me to get the quality and particularly the level of detail that we're talking about tonight. So you could flip another one, Mitch. All right. So these are not very surprising. In fact, these are, this list is 30 years old. Um, came out of some research and then was written up again by Donald Graves in his wonderful book called A Fresh Look at Writing, I think it is. A big green book. It was the very first book on writing that I read. Um, all the kids that of the pe the pieces that you just saw, um, the kids the kids took a lot of time. Um, on average, uh, I want kids to publish about every two weeks. That means they'll have ten full class periods of time, more than fifty percent of which will always be given over to uh, personal. Uh, individual writing. Doesn't mean we're all doing narratives. You saw some research there. I get to choose the form because that's usually related to curriculum that has to be covered. But the point is, is that the kids have a lot of time and they know they're going to have a lot of time. They know they're going to write every day. They know exactly when and they're going to have 25, 30, sometimes 40 minutes uh, in a day to work on their pieces. Next, uh, let's go, let's see, can we shoot ahead? Mitch, let me see where I am in my slide. OK, go back. Sorry, I, I got ahead of myself. All right, the next thing is choice. I really need kids to choose their own topics. Uh, there's two reasons for that. One is I have no idea um, until very, very a long time has passed in the year whether a particular kid will resonate with a particular topic. And if I give kids a prompt or I pick a topic for the class, I'm never going to get one that 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 is equally uh, it's an equal opportunity for all the kids to do best. So I, what I do is I teach kids how to pick topics. If you're interested in the topic selection strategies that I use, just ping me and I'll send you a whole bunch of them. Um, the important thing that I, I stress about choice, I think we all know how positive it is for kids, but a lot of people uh, equate this with free choice, where kids can write anything they want about anything all the time, and they just, boys keep writing about video games over and over again, and girls write about whatever girls are writing about that month in class. Um, this is not free choice. It's what I call guided choice or bounded choice. And I usually say to the kids, you guys get to choose your topic within these parameters. So if, if I need an expository piece, I have a topic selection tool that I use, which will only generate topics from kids that are suitable for expository writing. And then I'll explain to them with some models and some of my own modeling what that is. But they get to choose what it is they want to give me the information about. If we're in a subject area specifically, say like social studies, um, uh, the topic may be the Revolutionary War. You may have to pick something from the Revolutionary War. Hopefully, we've spent some time talking about that. But I have some other techniques to help kids cross their personal interests and the things they care about most with the subject that we're dealing with so that they can have a, choose a good topic, even in a subject that they may not feel very comfortable in. The next thing that's really important is purpose. Um, kids need to know why they're writing these things beyond the fact that I would like to see them write and have and be able to collect some writing samples from them to perhaps assess. Um, kids really don't care about that, and they're right not to care about that. That's our purpose for giving the assignment. That has nothing to do with them as, as little human beings, let alone them as writers. Um, the way I bring purpose into the writing classroom is to talk to them about what they're going to do with their writing when it's done, which is to say, why are you writing this? That's the purpose question. And usually, um, 
I'll have kids send their writing somewhere, post it somewhere. Nowadays, we can put it up all over the web and all over the place. Um, sometimes when we do persuasive writing, I actually have kids send their persuasive piece in a letter form to the right person they're, they're trying to persuade. Um, and so that there is a real sense of purpose. There's a real reason for the kid in writing this. That's probably the biggest driver of perseverance. And if there's one thing I have to say about all the examples that I showed you and the best examples that I get, they all come from kids who persevere uh, very, very well through a two or three week period and a lot of editing and revising. Um, the catalyst for that editing and revising is a real audience. Um, once again, the teacher is sort of the audience, but we're not really a, 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 a real audience to kids. We're just their teachers, and that's fine. Um, I don't really expect the kids to entertain me a lot with their writing, and I don't think they expect to entertain me very much either. Um, so I, I start by building an audience in the classroom so the kids are at least writing to other kids in the classroom and sharing information with them. But I try to broaden that as quickly as possible to other classrooms, other grade levels, other schools, um, and now uh, with so much technology, the world at large. Um, I give kids a lot of places to publish their writing and teach them a lot of ways to reach audiences and to get feedback. That's the most important thing. One of the reasons these pieces become so detailed is because I teach kids a very simple thing. I, uh, I found out really early in my teachings, almost 20 years ago, that uh, no kid I knew could tell me what a detail was. I would go into the classroom and I'd say, kids, what's a detail? And the consensus answer was a little thing or something teachers ask us to put in our writing. Um, neither of those answers helps you come up with details. So I just tell kids, because I, I, I know this is true, that a detail is the answer to a question a reader might have. So if you're writing a piece about um, the Daffodil Parade or being scared or George Washington, um, think about the questions that your audience is going to ask and write the answers down. Those are probably the best details. But don't just Play that game in your head, share your piece with your audience as often as you can. And I usually facilitate uh, with a little rule that I use early in the writing process. I call it questions only during drafting. So when a kid is still drafting their piece, the feedback I allow for a couple of days are questions because questions are generative. And what I usually do is I just have the kid answer the question. And then on, on the, question, the answers are almost always right on topic and, and right on point because they're just direct questions and direct answers. And I just immediately say, scribble that down. And they, take, they have their paper up with them. And they just scribble a note down. And then sometimes I have somebody in the audience uh, taking questions down to give to the writer uh, when they go back to their seat. So a two or three minute share session can come up with uh, three or four questions and that can lead to a whole nice set of details. The nice thing about that approach is that the details are locked then to the topic and the audience and the purpose. Um, students and topics. Do students get the opportunity to choose topics to work on? Yes, they absolutely do. That's the whole point. Um, they have to choose their own topics, as I said. Um, I have to give them the parameters around which to choose their topics. Is it a narrative? Is it an informational piece? Are we doing a, something in history? Are we writing fiction? I usually give them the former genre. And then sometimes I give them other parameters, uh, length parameters, for example. I never give minimum lengths because that encourages kids to puff their writing up with junk. I always give them maximums, and I make them very short. So I'll say, write me something in 250 words or less. Write me something in 150 words. Write me something with older kids. I'll say, keep it under 400. Um, and if you take that, those two constraints, uh, they're picking their own topic, so their ownership is higher. They're within my curricular uh, boundaries, which is great. And uh, they're sharing with an audience who wants to know a lot. And yet they have this upper limit on the number of words they can use that immediately kicks them into revision and doing the one thing that we really, really need them to do to get quality detail, which is to know the difference between a good detail and a poor detail. I don't want just every detail. I want the best details, the good details. And the best way to do that is to have too many and too little room to put them in and to weigh them, uh, sometimes with the audience's help, as to how well they um, enhance the main idea or thesis of the piece. Uh, time, choice, purpose, audience. You can go a long way on that. But 
none of those things has explicit instruction in them. And the bottom three, this is how I distinguish sort of the top four from the bottom three. The bottom three work together. Models, criteria, strategy. You can, in fact, teach anything that you want to teach in any subject at any grade for the rest of life, in school, out of school, doesn't matter. If you start with a model, ask your, whoever you're teaching it to simply to start talking about what's good about it. Write that down. That becomes the criteria. And then for every criteria element that the audience provides or that you provide because it's part of your rubric or whatever, for every criteria element, all you do is you match your lessons up with each element in the criteria. Some lessons cover more than one element. Some lessons, uh, some elements require uh, more than one lesson. Some criteria elements are much less important than others and don't really require any lessons. And I know most of us in big, huge rubrics where uh, it looks like there are 10 or 15 or 20 things to check off. But if you find exactly the right one or two, you'll notice that seven or eight of the others come along. So we start with a model. We generate our criteria. And I almost never present a rubric to the kids. I always uh, guide them in making uh, their own. Now, the truth of the matter is, is I know what rubric I'm using. And I'm going to nudge kids towards the things that are in mine. But it's really nice to get their buy-in and their interaction and to get their own language. Because often the words that I have written down are not really words that resonate very well with kids. I, I end up teaching all over the country. And um, I can't take for granted that the words I use to describe something in Seattle, Washington are the same words they're going to use in Long Island, New York, um, or uh, the difference between urban areas and rural areas and suburbs, and different districts in different states. Everybody has different language. And I want the language to come from the kids as much as it can. And I want to uh, sort of validate that it's good language to use. Um, the last pieces are, are the strategies. This is what we usually think of as the lessons um, and the, the techniques. But what I want to do is point out that, that they have to be linked to the criteria and the criteria have to be linked back to the models. That's the instructional piece. And that's where I'm able to remember to teach the right set of lessons, no matter which set of kids I'm working with. Um, I don't, I'm not a real planner. Um, and I often am in teaching situations where I'm, I just don't have a planning opportunity. Um, but I know model criteria strategy. And so no matter what we're doing, even if it's not writing, if it's calculus or biology or any other things I've done, um, I'll I always ask for a model of what we're trying to create. I'll have the kids in the room, sometimes the host teacher, help me with criteria. And then I know exactly what to teach to. So time, choice, purpose, and audience sort of set up the, the, the ability for kids to learn and be successful. And then what really drives the explicit teaching and the quality are models, criteria, and strategies. And those are the instructional conditions, time, choice, purpose, audience, models, criteria, strategies. And now we're going to take about five minutes or so to discuss a little something among yourselves. Uh, here's the question. Um, what prevents us from doing all of these things well? I'm making the claim here that all of these have to be in place to get really good writing that we want. And so what I'd like you to do is talk a little bit. You can ping me in the IM window if you want. But for the next, uh, I don't know, probably about five minutes, Mitch, um, uh, talk this over. And think, of, think if there's one or two of those things. Most of you do many of those things really well. There might be one or two that are uh, a little uh, not not as tuned up as you'd like, and maybe I can help you with. Nathan. So this is the time to uh, to couple up with another attendee. So if you uh, if you see the icon of somebody else who's here, uh, click on it and discuss what are the, what are the different. What are the things that prevent us from doing all these things well? And obviously, in a couple minutes, you're not going to have time to discuss all all seven uh, different elements. But uh, talk about you know one or two of the elements and that you feel uh, are obstacles to you and your students from from doing these things well. Um, if you don't have video, maybe you can type some of these elements into the IM window, and uh, Steve can see what they are in the, in the IM window. So we give you about three or four more minutes.
to go ahead and discuss with other people. Again, click on somebody's icon and I'll pull myself down and then we'll come back up in a couple minutes. Okay, let me bring Steve back up also. I'm going to answer. Hey, Steve. So, so hey, I'm, Mitch. Of, of, of those seven, uh, which, when you talk to teachers generally around the, around the country, which are the ones that they most often bring up? Uh, the same one that's coming up in the, in the IM window here. Um, uh, the first the choice is the, is the tough one. Most, most of us don't feel we can facilitate a way for kids to choose their own topics. And, and I will agree that this drove me crazy the first year I worked with kids, and I had disaster after disaster. Um, with it, uh, which is why I developed so many topic selection techniques. Um, again, if you want to go to my website, you'll find a bunch of those in the Writing Teacher Strategy Guide, or just ping me after the show here, and I'll send you some stuff. I have a new book coming out in a couple weeks. And it's got a bunch of new topic selection tools in there, too. Um, uh, That's interesting, because I would have thought that time would be a big one also. Well, I was going to say this, that, that, that in the modern classroom, or I should say the contemporary classroom, 20 years ago, this was not a problem. But now that we have uh, made some very bad decisions, um, in, I, I, I don't want to put this on people. What I want to say is that collectively in the United States, we as individual educators, make decisions uh, for good reasons, but that are not good decisions. Um, one of them is that I've seen is to cut down the amount of time we offer just for writing. I've done, I've been hired by states to talk to people from 50 school districts, none of whom have time in their schedule just for writing, because what their districts say is, well, you can teach writing in any other subject. And the reason that doesn't work is because there has to be a time when kids can only work on their writing. That's how they get better. Otherwise, they're just uh, knocking out sentences about stuff they may or may not know much about. So you're right, Mitch. Time, time does come, but, but I don't see time as a very hard one to fix. You either have it or you don't. You either want it or you don't. You either get it or you don't. There's no lesson that you have to teach to get time. Um, whereas topic selection is kind of key, unless you have a lot of tools. And um, and then and then the other aspect about time it's not just time for the students to do the writing, but if you have a class of thirty students, mm -hmm. they may they may only be spending an hour writing, but now you've got to spend time by thirty to go over all of their different work. So it's yeah. So I I I do need I do need to be very focused and efficient in my conferencing with students. But the other the other thing is um, I. Try to keep the lesson really short. Um, sometimes I don't even have one. Um, the lesson is the least valuable part of any writing time classroom. Writing time is the most important. And as we're getting near to publishing, I'll often say it's a total work day. Um, and then what I've done is develop a tiny little procedure for myself, um, which is I will, I will pop up to a kid for a conference. They know they have to have their stuff ready. Um, We'll look at a little bit. I have to. They, I teach them how to tell me what they need help with. I answer their question. I give them a little bit of help. And then there's another requirement in the class. They must attempt what I've asked them to do. It may not work, but they've got to try it. They can't sit there, bog me down for two minutes, and then not take the advice I give them. That's just not fair to the other kids or to me or to anybody. So um, uh, I think we have to sort of run a tight ship. They have to know. Uh, that I do need to get around to a lot of kids really quickly. And so I have to know that the time I'm spending uh, is valuable. Um, again, this goes back to just the requirements of basic participation in the classroom. Um, we all have uh, different ways of doing that. I just literally make a list of the participation requirements. And I just say, these are pass-fail. You either do them all or you flunk. Um, people think that's very harsh, but in fact, nobody ever flunks because they're all behavioral. None of them are skill-based. Um, I never, I never have a requirement that a kid can't fulfill. And if I do accidentally make one, I change it. So you don't say things like use five more adjectives in this. Paragraph. Oh gosh, no, 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 never stuff like that. They're never skill or quality based. They're all behavioral. Like if you want a conference, Please have your paper ready when I get there. So you've called, you've raised your hand, or you've I've come to your desk, Mitch, and you're you know who knows where your story is. You know I'm just going to leave your desk. 
-hmm. and I'm going to say, put your name on the board on the list, and I'll come back to you when your name comes up. But when your name comes up, I'm going to say, Mitch, I'll be there in 30 seconds. That's your cue to get your paper out, or I'm not coming back again. Okay, so in five seconds, I'm going to put your slides back up. That's your okay, good. We'll go to the second half here. I'll show you quickly the uh, five little strategies that I use for details. And again, we're going to go through these way too quickly. Um, but the whole slide deck will be yours. Uh, you can get lots of detailed information on all of these from my website. And of course, you can write to me at any time, stevepeha at ttms.org. And I will answer your questions as promptly and as fully as I can. So draw label caption, chaining, idea details, tell show, action, feeling, setting. Five strategies. These are very little, very easy strategies. I've used them with kindergartners in various ways, work with all grades. I even use them uh, with adult writers. So let's go to the first one, Mitch. Uh, this is from a workshop called Small Pieces, Big Gains. I told you that I encourage kids to write short, and that helps them publish more and make more uh, uh, progress. And uh, I use these little teeny strategies uh, throughout this kind of teaching. Go to the next one. Uh, going, flip one other one. OK, draw label caption, very simple. Uh, flip this one, Mitch. Uh, let's flip that one. OK, so first thing I have the kids do is draw a little picture of their topic. Now, this is really just a quick sketch. I don't want it to take more than a minute or two. Um, how do I get kids to do it quickly? I time them. I do a lot of stuff to get the class moving quickly by timing kids. I use my watch, stopwatch. I use my phone. Kids like to see it on my phone. Um, and I just give them, I say, OK, you got two minutes to sketch your picture. So that's just, just a quick sketch. Go ahead to the next one. That's the draw part. This is the label part. I tell kids to uh, label every single thing they can see in their picture. And I'll walk around and give them a few minutes to do this, because I'm going to point to things. I'm going to say, hey, what's that? They'll say, oh, those are the trees. I'll say, come on, write that down. And all they have to write is trees. If the kids in kindergarten or first grade can't fully spell, they have to try to get any letter they want. If they spell something wrong, all they have to do is underline it. And I will give them the correct spelling without talking to them, simply by writing it on a post-it note the next time I come up to their desk. If they've underlined words they don't know how to spell, I know they don't know how to spell them. I know they've tried. I don't need to ask them about it. We don't need to go through sounding anything out. They've already tried. So we get as many labels as possible, because every single label is a detail. And with older kids, I actually have them label the labels. So uh, in the back there where it says birds, I might uh, throw, ask the kid to throw another label off that, telling me a little bit about the birds or the trees. And I can get labels on labels on labels on labels. And somehow at times I get 20 or 30 or 40 of these labels in a piece, and the piece is completely detailed right at this stage. They just haven't written it up. What I do want kids, though, to do is to bring a little focus to this, is to go to the next slide, if you would, Mitch is the caption. And all I ask kids to do is write like one or two sentences about this. Um, very simple. But I do have some ways of, of working this. So this is the simplest kind of sentence. The kid's just playing Frisbee with his dog. OK, go to the next slide. And what I show kids is that there's sort of like some different levels of sentences we can, we can start with. I'm throwing the Frisbee with my dog, fine. Uh, here's another better one. As I turn to throw the Frisbee, a huge gust of wind blows up. So remember from last week, uh, last month, that's an intro and a main. That's just a very simple sentence structure that I teach kids for one of the first days of school, basically. Um, and then we, we try, as we move through this strategy, to get better and better at, at stretching this out and making a whole paragraph out of the, the start of this. Uh, and that's where things start to get good. This sometimes takes a, a few times through this strategy, but it's, it's pretty straightforward. So draw label caption. Um, this is the easiest strategy uh, in my kit of tools. And I have to say, people get extraordinary value out of it. I, I never thought it was much when I started with it, but people really love it. And they've really taken it a long, long way. So let's go to the next one, Mitch. OK, notice that once I get kids to put the labels down, I can ask them to write a sentence about it. It's fair game if I'm conferencing. If the kid has picked the trees, they must be important. So I can say, tell me something about the trees, a story. Oh, they're swaying from side to side. Oh, is that because of the wind? Yeah, well, what? tell me something about the wind. Well, it's almost knocking me over. OK, great, write that down. And so all I'm really doing is, is helping the kid tell their own story. Um, they've told me they recognize these things in their pieces. Um, I'm just helping them get uh, uh, 
oral language down into written form. Next one, Mitch. Thank you. So um, this usually gets to something that's a little more sophisticated. I do a lot of what's called micro prose with kids, really, really short pieces, um, 50 words, 100 words. And this is a good example of a piece that I would consider a completely finished piece. Um, and if you look at it, the writing here is not too bad. It's, it's not going to win any Pulitzer Prizes, but if you thought about a, a third grader, um, hey, I'm looking at uh, Maureen is asking me, do you ever use examples like, and she's got telescopic text. I have it, Maureen, uh, but I'd like to check it out. And I will just grab that URL and throw it in my browser right now. Um, it's really good to have lots of sources for, for uh, uh, models, and the more you have, the better you can use them and, and be successful. So let's go to the next strategy. That is a very simple strategy. Everyone uses it. This is a more interesting strategy, but it's almost as simple. I use this a lot more with informational writing. It's called chaining, and it, it actually isn't really a writing strategy. It's really just what writers do a lot of the time. And I turned it into a strategy so I could teach it explicitly to kids. So the idea is that um, we write sentences and we hook them together um, into a paragraph and, and paragraphs into pieces. And the whole idea is to make them linked uh, by something in the previous element. So if you go to the next, next screen, um, so this is about, uh, oh, this is something I was modeling for the kids about uh, a study that came out a few years ago about kids' study schools skills. So I've got a first sentence there. And I'm going to want to write a second sentence, but I'm going to want to make sure that the second sentence is linked very closely to the first sentence. And I really want the second sentence to be generated from the first sentence. It's as though I'm one of those blocked up kids and all I can write is one sentence. And that's usually what I say to the kids. Can you give me one sentence? And they usually can. And I say, OK, we can go the rest of the way. So this is the first sentence. A recent study shows that kids spend more time on less effective learning techniques and less time on more effective learning techniques. And then as the link, I'm going to ask myself, what's really the most important thing I want to talk about? I'm going to pull that out. And I think as the link here, I'm going to use effective learning techniques. And in the second, second, second sentence, I'm literally going to repeat that language. The most effective learning techniques appear to be those that require active recall of information kids need to learn. I know those two sentences work absolutely perfectly, and that the logic is perfect, and that the reader will follow them because they are linked literally by a phrase from the previous sentence. Let's go to the next, uh, next screen, take a look a little farther. Um, there's another way to find a link, and I usually I say, I say, I tell kids, uh, use both of these ways, but the, the first one is pulling out something literally verbatim from the previous sentence. The next one is look at your sentence and think about a question, a really important question your readers would ask, and then answer it. So um, the sentence, the first sentence here that I'm working with is commonly used learning techniques like highlighting, rereading, and summarizing from a text require little active attention. And I'm thinking, I'm posing a question here, why is active attention so important? And then I'll just answer that as the second sentence. Active attention is the key to remembering things because memory is the residue of thought. We tend to remember the things we think about most. That's not an original line from me. That's every brain scientist in the world. And that wonderful phrase, uh, memory is the residue of thought, comes from Dan Willingham. And if you really want a wonderful book that talks about uh, all this stuff about learning and brains and why kids learn things and don't, get his book, uh, Why Students Don't Like School. He has nine reasons, um, and they're all based simply on whether or not kids can learn anything. Not w whether kids have the ability to learn, but whether we provide the conditions that would allow them to learn. That's a wonderful book, and he's a wonderful scientist, so I follow his work a lot. He's the guy that put me onto this study. Um, so that's chaining. Two ways to find a link. Start with one sentence and pull out a, a word or two. Use that as sort of a seed for the next sentence. Then you go to the third sentence by pulling out a word from that and chain sentences together. The other way to chain is by posing a question. I usually tell kids to mix them up. Do a couple verbatim, then a couple of questions, and then try to wrap up a paragraph. We can also chain, chain paragraphs, which is to say I can take something from the first paragraph 
verbatim, and I can plug it in as the topic of the second paragraph. Or I can look at the first paragraph, pose a question, and use the answer as the topic of the second paragraph, and use chaining all over again. So it's actually possible with this one strategy to write a perfectly logical and extremely well-detailed essay of infinite length with only this one strategy and two variations. Very powerful, and if you try it, I swear you'll have the same experience I did. You'll, you'll, you'll realize, oh, I'm just writing. I'm not doing a trick, I'm just writing. The only reason I made this into a strategy and I do it in kind of a graphical way is so that I can teach it explicitly to kids. I think there's a big difference between telling kids write like this versus do this first, second, third, fourth, now you're done, that's called this. So the next time I ask you to do this, go through these four steps. I'm really big on explicitness. I wish I could say I learned that uh, myself, but I didn't. I learned it from very good teachers in Australia and New Zealand. Uh, a long time ago about how important it is to be explicit. So let's go to the next one, Mitch. We've done two so far. Um, let's get past this. There's just some bullet points about why chaining is good. Here's the, here's the big one. I mean, it's a tiny strategy, but here's the big one. In Western discourse, that is to say, the English language and all uh, Western cultural languages, all writing comes down to one structural form. That st underlying structural form is an idea and a set of supporting details. If I always tell kids this, if you're only going to learn one thing from me your entire life, learn this strategy because with it you will be able to write anything ever forever. And it's not even very hard. I do tell them that having only one strategy will make their writing kind of boring, but uh, no kidding, everything that I do is based in one way or another on the idea detail strategy. So go ahead, Minch. Uh, the idea detail strategy, like most of my strategies, is ridiculously simple. Um, throw an idea on the left side, write down as many details as you think you can on the, sorry, throw an idea on the left side, write down as many details as you think you can on the right side. I'm writing complete sentences usually when I show a slideshow, but I usually don't do that when I write, uh, the kid, and I don't tell the kids they have to write complete sentences either. The other thing, of course, since a detail is an answer to a question, then uh, we can just find out what questions people have about this idea and simply write those questions down and answer them. And um, if you go to the next slide, Mitch, Thank you. All I do is put the idea on top and all the rest of the sentences are off the chart. It makes a topic sentence paragraph. I'm not really big on topic sentence paragraphs. I don't teach kids how to write them. I don't think they're very good or very interesting. So that'd be more than once or twice in a multi-paragraph piece. Um, I certainly don't want to use several in a row. But um, they're very easy to create. And this is another, this is another thing that, that's really important to me. I don't really need to waste a lot of time teaching a lot of lessons because many of the strategies produce the result. So I don't have to teach topic sentence paragraph and I don't have to teach paragraphing because virtually every strategy I have produces a paragraph. Um, and I just tell the kids that they know how to paragraph and that what they are doing is writing a paragraph. And I don't usually have to teach about it. Um, so again, if you take a look at that idea details, you could take any detail that was in this paragraph, put it on the, put it on the left side as an idea, write down more details about it and go forward. And this is just a big kid version of chaining. That's all it is. Chaining really is idea and details. What is draw label caption? It's idea and details. Everything is idea and details. It doesn't mean we only want to teach these this one strategy. It just means that I want them to know that everything in Western rhetoric, Western discourse, comes down to having an idea and the details you have to tell people about it. Next slide, please. I'm going to wrap up in about five minutes here. Thanks for hanging in a little bit. Go to the next one, Mitch. We'll look for the next strategy. Tell show. Okay, this is the one that helps me with most with the showing detail. Flip the next slide. And here we go. Okay, showing detail or descriptive detail is the hardest kind of detail for kids to get. And I was taught to do it through sensory stuff. And uh, there's a very simple reason that didn't work for me. Uh, it's because I thought all the senses were kind of equal in writing, and they're really not. Um, and um, sh uh, thinking about your sensory detail leaves out the most important person who generates the detail, the audience. Um, your details have to come from questions that your audience would have. So what I usually do is take some very vacuous, generic telling language, like the weather was scary. That could mean anything. 
Who knows what that means? And then on the other side, I describe it. Thunder and lightning, flash flood. This actually happened, by the way. Uh, we have a little creek by our house, and it's a, it's a alluvial something or other, which means it's not really a creek. It's only used for rain runoff. And when we get a, when we get a flash flood here, it almost comes up to our house. So uh, thunder and lightning, flash flooding in our front yard. Uh, water was so deep in our driveway, we couldn't get our cars out. So we had to have a little evacuation plan. Uh, we saw a small deer get swept away down the creek. It was really sad, but he got out. It was okay. Um, six inches of rain fell in half an hour. Um, just typical flash flood kind of stuff. We were just fine. But now if you go to the next paragraph, I'm oh, sorry, the next slide, thunder boomed and lightning lit up the sky like an explosion. A flash flood ripped through our front yard as six inches of rain fell in half an hour and the creek came up almost all the way to the house. The water was so deep in our driveway we couldn't get out. Neither could a small deer as it was swept away in the rising rapids. Now, here's a neat thing that I tell kids. Most, you know, all of that comes from my chart, and I'm just, I'm just uh, uh, embellishing it a little bit to make it a little better as I write it down. But you'll notice that the topic sentence isn't there. Nowhere does it say the weather is scary. And this is why topic sentences are pretty much a waste and, and redundant. It's because if the details are good enough, you can infer the topic instantly. Does this look like scary weather? If I wrote it well, it does. If I didn't write it well, telling you it's scary weather isn't going to help. So one of the neatest things I do is I work the tell-show strategy a lot. And I work it in a lot of different ways, not just for descriptive detail, but I do it a lot in informational writing and persuasive writing and argumentative writing. If you tell me that uh, we're having too many car accidents in the United States because of cell phones and, and inattention, show me what you mean by that. Describe it. Show me with statistics show me somehow what you're trying to tell me because I may or may not believe you and you telling it to me doesn't help. What I need is to, is to have you show me that something is true. So it's just as important in descriptive writing and uh, expository writing, persuasive writing, argumentative writing, narrative writing. Showing descriptive detail is the core of successful detail in all forms of writing. Notice also, though, that, that tell show is not much different than idea details. It just has a different emphasis. All right, I'm going to wrap it up. Go to uh, the next one and the next one after that. All right, action feeling setting. Uh, long time ago, I was teaching some first graders, and they were getting up one after the other with these stories. And I swear that day I couldn't understand a single story they were telling me. And a kid would get up, and I would say, like, what's happening there? And the kid would tell me, and I'd say, well, why don't you write that down in the piece first so I know what's happening? And then a kid would go a long, a long way, and I'd say, where are you? Cause I, and, and then they'd tell me, and I'd say, well, why don't you write that down first so I know the setting? And then finally, kids would ramble on with no voice, no emotion whatsoever. I would say, how are you feeling when all this was happening? And they'd tell me, and I'd say, why don't you put that in your piece so that we can get emotionally attached? And I, I kept saying... Give me some action, give me some feelings, give me some setting. I said it so many times over a two-day period, I just made it into a strategy. And I taught it as an explicit lesson, and I just told kids that they, they, they had to have these three things anytime they wrote a narrative of any kind, um, fiction or nonfiction. So go to the next one. And, okay, so here's, uh, here's how I use it, say, in history. Um, this is the big three at Yalta. You'll probably re uh, recognize uh, Churchill, Roosevelt, and Stalin. Uh, they had their meeting uh, at the Yalta Conference after World War II to sort of carve up Europe. Um, go to the next slide, if you would, Mitch. All right, so uh, what's the action? Winston Churchill, Franklin Roosevelt, and Joseph Stalin pose impatiently for a photograph. That's the whole action right there. At the opening of the Yalta Conference, which has since come to symbolize the end of World War II and the beginning of the Cold War. That's the action. That's what's going on. And this is uh, about a high school level kid, probably junior high, uh, taking a shot at giving me a paragraph for the action. Let's go to the next slide. Feelings. This is really interesting relative to this particular subject because the emotional character of the three men actually was what determined uh, the next 50 years of, of world history. Roosevelt was weak and tired. His health was failing. He would die in two months. Churchill presented a stubborn and defiant posture, but gave in to the reality of Soviet power. Churchill was pretty wiped out, too, and so was England. And Stalin had a big, huge army. He was younger. He was tougher and stronger in a way, more brutal. Stalin felt strong, energetic, even youthful. 
His 12 million man army was the largest in Europe by far. He knew he could drive a hard bargain and win. And this is how and why ultimately Europe got carved up the way it did and the Cold War began. Uh, it really came down to the fact that two representatives from one from the US and one from one from Great Britain um, simply were not feeling very good. And Stalin was healthy as a horse and ready to drive his bargain into the ground. Let's go to the setting. This would be this story wouldn't make sense if we didn't know much about where they were. This is the meeting of the big three at the former palace of Tsar Nicholas on the Crimean shore of the Black Sea. It took place February 4 to 11, 1945. Tells you right away, Stalin's playing on home turf. Um, Roosevelt had hoped to deal with Russia through the soon to be created United Nations. So Roosevelt knows he's gonna die, he knows he's doing poorly now, uh, and he's really hoping to push the United Nations through and uh, uh, deal with Stalin that way. Uh, he knew this was not the place and time to negotiate with Stalin. And here's a quote from Roosevelt. He's kind of upset with himself. I didn't say the result was good, he said to an associate. Uh, I said that it was the best I could do. Um, Roosevelt, neither Roosevelt nor Churchill felt very good about what came out of Yalta. Uh, but they were both uh, upset with themselves and upset with the general state of things uh, after the war. So uh, that's a very simple strategy. It's generally associated with personal narrative or fiction, but it can be used anytime there's narrative. And in history, there's, uh, of course, quite a lot of narrative. So uh, Mitch, if you'd flip ahead and folks keep going. Next one. All right. So you can combine all these strategies together. And if you're sticking around for a few more minutes, I really appreciate that. You can just flip to the next strategy, Mitch. Or sorry, the next screen. Here's a screen that you'll get. It tells you all these different combinations you can use to create longer pieces by combining these little strategies together. Go to the next screen. All right, so five small strategies can be combined and rearranged in an infinite number of ways to produce almost every kind of writing imaginable and they can each be used by kindergartners. So if all you had were these five teeny strategies, you could slowly but surely produce any kind of writing you needed. I have bigger strategies, which I'm going to show in the fourth workshop in April, each one of which uh, outlines an entire piece. But um, if you just want to start with these small ones, they work really, really well. So let's go to the next slide. All right, here's the group discussion question. If you want to talk for a few minutes, um, it's, it's very simple. Uh, these strategies have been used in all grades and in all subjects. And, and over a million, I've had over a million downloads of this strategy set from my website. So quite a lot of people have used them over the last 20 years. So I know they work. The question is, what would keep us from using them? Again, that same question at the beginning that we asked before, what would keep us from making these structures happen in our classroom? What would keep us from using all five of these strategies? And let's chat a bit and I will answer some questions in the... <laughs> Nathan, thank you. This reminds me how much I hated topic sentences in school. I wish they stressed detail writing more in school. Nathan, that is the big lesson for me. I'm not saying that's the lesson of this workshop, but that was the for me when I started teaching writing. I knew I didn't want to put the kids through what I'd been through in school because it wasn't helpful. At the same time, I didn't know how to teach details and I got nothing from the kids. And I remember the first class I was with for a month, I just apologized to them and said, we're going to start over, take a week off from writing, and I'm going to go learn something about how to teach you how to do it. Um, and that was exactly the key for me, was ditching some of the things I learned in schools and Nathan says he also subscribed to the newsletter. Uh, any of you can subscribe to the newsletter. You get uh, updates from me and free stuff and just generally curated uh, things here. If you just go to my front page, I only have a one page website right now. More stuff coming when the new book comes out. Um, the new book, by the way, uh, oh, Patrick says the devil is in the details. Yes, what I, often, what I often point out to people is, yes, the devil is in the details. But I think it was, uh, someone said, uh, God is in the details is another famous quote. So no matter which side of this you're on, uh, uh, everything is in the details. It's all in the details. Um, uh, yes, Nathan. Uh, Nathan asks, uh, the Yalta thing is a good example. Students who need to revert research this. Yes. Uh, quite often when we're in a subject area, um, we will either write afterwards or sometimes I like them to pick uh, a topic area early so that I could steer them some in some ways toward research that they need to do. But here's the thing. If you know what you're writing about, 
You can generate your key questions. And oftentimes I tell kids, look, you want to get your paper written. Here's the easiest thing. Share your thesis or your idea or your topic with me or somebody in the room or get up and share. Write down as many questions as you get. Sort them by the ones you think are the most interested. Take them right down to the librarian. Have the librarian answer them all for you. I've instructed the librarian that, that, that he or she, if she has the time, is just to answer the questions for you. Because interviews and talking to people in email are exactly how I do all my research. My wife uh, is, a, is a journalist and, and brand journalist and content strategist. She literally writes two or 300 published pieces a year. And she does a lot of web research, but she does almost all of it through interviews. And interviews are the fastest and best way to get the best uh, information into your story. So um, any thoughts? Should we break out? And uh, any thoughts or questions about these strategies that I can answer in a few minutes before we go? Yeah, I was thinking that since it's uh, almost 12 after, that instead of yeah. having to break into groups, uh, they have questions or they have comments. They should put them into the IM, and um, you know, and we'll we'll farm them uh, from the from the IM. Um, you know, one of the things that that occurs to me is that uh, to produce great writing, you have to get kids to really want to revise. Um, are you going to do a session on revisions at all? I think I am, um, but I, I um, and if I'm not, I certainly will. But one That's of the fine. things I like to point one of the things I like to point out is that everything we just did is revision. And everything we did last everything we did last month is revision. And everything we're going to do in the next two is revision. So revision is very hard. And because it's so hard, I actually don't teach it. I use it as a behavior. So one of my behavioral requirements is you got to revise your writing. And kids will say, what does that mean? And I'll say, well, there's five things you got to do. You don't have to do them every piece. You got to add something, you got to delete something, you got to change something, you got to move something, or you got to let something stand. Let stand means you consider changing it, and then upon sharing, you realize it's necessary. And I teach kids those five things. Um, uh, Patrick's asking, can this webinar be shared with peers? Patrick, I believe the webinar will be available shortly, right, Midge? Right, today's uh, Wednesday, right? Uh, so it should be, should be uh, most likely will be available by Monday. Um, on Great. our website, and we'll send everybody who registered. We'll send everybody an, an email about uh, when it's up. And yeah, then, and I've got I've got the registration. Oh, sorry, I've got the registration list here, and I will get out to you probably certainly by Monday, hopefully by Friday. Um, you'll all get a link to the slide deck from me, and I will send you some links to some other materials that I think are relevant to the things we're studying together, uh, so that you have some tools and you don't have to go. Uh, um, digging around for them. Right, and we, Mitch, you know, I'm yeah. just hoping um, everybody, I, I know, I, I, Steve, I always find you interesting, and I do a lot of writing myself, but I never had these tools. Um, so this really is, is helping me organize my writing. Hopefully, well, hey. people will enjoy Thanks, my, my newsletters a lot more. Um, well, and, you know, here, here's the, I'm glad you brought that up, because what I want is for kids to have the same strategies that you or I would benefit from, mm -hmm. and that's been the truth of these. I've taught these to kids in third grade and flown across the country and taught them to the marketing team at John Hancock the next day. And the adults, of course, have a harder time because they're professionals and they don't need strategies. Right. Uh, the little kids do exactly what I tell them to do. <laughs> <laughs> but we all use the same tools. So, and Thanks. then March 9th is, is the next, the next, the third uh, yep. of, of your webinars, and that's going to be on revision, re revising strategies. Oh, it is. Okay, great. Yeah. Then we're going to talk trying, about revising there. <laughs> right. I was trying to, to, to toss you a softball, and I Oh, I know. All right. Thank you. That's all right. That's all right. Um, we're going to talk about revision, and you just got a preview of it. I'm going to talk about these five behaviors that we want kids to know, and I'm going to talk about some other ways to use the tools we have in, a, in an explicit revision capacity. What I like to do kids into a position where revision doesn't become a problem, where in fact we never mention the R word because really what they're doing is just writing something, deciding whether it's good enough, changing it, or moving on. And it just becomes a behavior just like an adult would do. And by that time your book should be published, fully published, correct? Yes, the book, uh, I will have uh, pre-release review copies probably early first week of March, certainly, and then the official release 
uh, will be about a month later, uh, first week of April. Okay, so, so if, for the last one. Uh, yeah, um, absolutely. And um, if people would like uh, review copies, and you're in the continental United States, so it doesn't cost me too much shipping, uh, send me your email uh, and uh, mailing address. And uh, uh, I have a, a number of slots for um, for pre-release review copies. I do want people to review the book, give us feedback on it. And uh, but if you'd like to get a free copy uh, while we're uh, while we're getting to roll out, um, please just drop me a note. The list is not full yet. So, and Andrew, just first of all, he said that uh, he loved this, uh, but he oh, also great. asked where the link is for the other webinars. And um, I have to give him. They're on your call. website, right? Right, ex except that your first webinar that you did a month ago, we had a technical problem. Oh, was, right, we had a backup problem. Yeah. So maybe what we'll do is after the April I, one, we'll schedule another one and we'll I'll, redo yeah, that. Yeah, I'll give that one again. Yeah, no problem at all. Um, and if anybody wants mater the material that goes with that webinar on sentence structure, I have it in several slide decks. Tell you what, I'll just put the links in the big email I sent out to everybody. So Mitch, I'll, okay. they'll get the slide decks and information that I was using to basically give the, the the stuff anyway, but you're right. Let's repeat whatever people miss. It's 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 easy to do and fun. Okay, great. All right, so uh, we'll, I'll I'll see you in about a month. All right, thanks a lot. Okay. Thanks everybody. Right. Really appreciate yeah. your time tonight. Drop thanks me a note. Time. I get lonely. <laughs> Bye. Okay, take care. Bye. And hope to see you all soon too. Thank you very much. This is Mitch Weisberg signing off for EdChat Interactive.